Honest Field Guide podcast, a weekly show dedicated to winning in entrepreneurship. I'm your host, Ginger Birkenbuehl. I'm the CEO of Burt Creative, a leadership, brand strategy, and visual identity agency dedicated to helping scale brands and assist with their adaptability with the market. On my show, you get to eavesdrop in on intimate conversation with business leaders and inspired entrepreneurs designed to give you tips and strategies so your own business can thrive. Subscribe and join me each week for laughter, inspiration, and honest stories. everybody. Welcome back to my show, The Honest Field Guide Podcast. I am your host, Ginger Birkenbuehl. Thank you so much for joining my show today. As I always say, you could be listening to any podcast in the world. You can be anywhere in the world. But right now you've decided to join my show, The Honest Field Guide Podcast. I am so grateful. If you are a new listener, please subscribe to my show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Share my show with your friends. The more people that hear my show, the better for my guests and the better for my show. And I would love it if you would leave a five-star review of the Honest Field Guide podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. So before I bring on my guest, and I am so excited about this guest of mine. This is the first time actually I've ever had on a guest that isn't a uh, someone that I know really well that is somebody that's in an exciting industry. And I'll share with you in a minute what that industry is. This is a really big deal for me, and it's definitely going to be a big deal for small business owners. But first, as you all know that have listened to my show, I always have to start off with a personal story because even though this is a special guest, there's a reason why I wanted this special guest on my show. And it kind of goes back to my childhood. I have to share a story about ownership and what it actually means to me. So I was raised by a single mom. For most of my life, my father and mother divorced before I was born. Not before I was born, but after I was right after I was born, my mother remarried. She went through a divorce again. I think I might have been in the fourth or the fifth grade. And I remember very distinctly, this is a while ago, and I'm not going to date myself. I'm not going to tell people how old I am. But, you know, back then, women owning a home was a very different experience than it is today. And I will never forget the stress that my mother went through when she was going through a divorce with the fear of her not having a home for her family. And it's something that really has been instilled in me as a entrepreneur and as a small business owner and as a woman that owns a lot of products and property. My mother instilled in me the importance of ownership, having your own money, having a pocket full of what she called mad money. And if you ever needed to get out of a date, you could always find your way home no matter what, because you had money in your pocket. So I emerged from college started my own business. I made a little money on the side with the business. You know, I went to a small town, uh, a college in rural Illinois, and it was kind of hard for me to find a job. So I started a little tiny business. I learned a lot about credit and money and ownership and things like that. And it set me up on a mindset for what can I do to own a lot of things? How can I own all the things I'm involved in from soup to nuts, right? So I went to work at one of the largest museum systems in the world, and I learned as I was working, as I graduated from art school, wow, I can't make my own decisions. I can't own any of the work that I create because I'm creating for a company. Then I went to work for one of the largest consulting firms in the world, and I had the same lesson. I learned that the things I created that I loved and that I put my heart and soul into, I really didn't own these things. And that's fine. You work for a company, you don't own these things. Um, it was exciting working for this large, this large consulting company for me because I learned some concepts I never, ever in a million years ever would have learned. I learned about ISO 9001, and I made this amazing marketing strategy for this company to help them understand how to actually help their clients understand about ISO. And, I, and my guests maybe can talk a little bit about that because it's kind of in that space. But it was during this corporate life that I had that I actually decided to launch a band. My band was Utah Carol with my husband, Grant. Um, He's my songwriting partner and my husband. We launched this band and I was an aspiring artist. And back then we had we had record albums. We had CDs and cassette tapes. Right. Um, But the main thing back then is I was like, okay, well, now that we have this record, we have to go get signed. And that was sort of the narrative. But as I was searching, I really started to understand how much labels were asking of us. And it was a lot of turning over a lot of ownership. 
not only ownership of the publishing rights, but ownership of the entire supply chain, like everything connected to that record was not going to be owned by me anymore. And so that was a time that I actually decided, okay, how can I become a manufacturer? What can I do? What can I do to become a manufacturer? And this is the thing that changed everything for me when I decided and I learned, no, I'm, I, yes, I'm an artist, but I'm a manufacturer, right? So I started my own label called Stomping Ground Studios, and I learned a lot about mechanical rights and things like that. But here's what really jumped out at me. After I launched all the different platforms like ASCAP and, you know, uh, Harry Fox Agency, I realized that, you know what, I'm going to sell a million records, but how will anybody know? How will anybody be able to figure this out that I did this? And that became me learning about what's called a tracking system, which back then was the Uniform Code Council. And it was like this whole world just exploded, exploded my brain. I was like, oh my God, I can be free. I can make my own stuff. I can do everything. I don't need anybody, you know? And this goes back to my mom teaching me to own things, right? And so I have an amazing woman on my show today, which I'm just so thrilled. And you can tell my energy and excitement around this because I'm finally getting to actually talk about something that I've been wanting to talk about probably my entire career. I have Michelle Covey, Covey, I'm sorry, Michelle Covey here on my show today. Um, she is the Vice President of Innovation at GS, GS1 US, where she oversees delivery of programs and services designed to support efficient and accurate GS1 standards implementation for companies of all sizes. Ms. Covey previously held multiple executive roles at GS1 US, leveraging her more than 20 years of retail supply chain experience. When you are a manufacturer or a retailer, you really do need an authentic way to identify your products if you want to sell them in stores or major online marketplaces, which is what I was just talking about. And GS1 barcodes are accepted all over the world. Yes, I said barcodes. Barcodes, you need a product. You have to have a barcode for all of your products, right? Um, and so I'm here today to talk to Michelle a little bit about that. Um, I'm so excited to have you on my show. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here with you. <laughs> Awesome. So I want to start out really by asking you a little bit more of a personal story before we kind of get sure. into the nuts and the bolts of, you know, GS1 and, and how it's transformed from UCC to GS1. Um, like me, I grew up in a family of workers, right? I did mm -hmm. not grow up seeing anybody really make anything except make a new life. You know, did you did you grow up in a family of people that manufactured things or did you see people making things? You know, I did not. I had a story very similar to yours. So um, I, really? uh, I was raised by a single mom for most of my life. Yes. And, um, you know, she was a very hard worker. And she, again, had this sense of she wanted to own property. That was a big goal for her. So um, it wasn't actually until she inherited some money from my grandmother that she was able to do it. But um, when my grandmother passed, but like by I think in high school, she ended up buying her own house and she was just so proud to be able to own a house of her own. Yep. Um, so I, I, and I remember her always saying, being able to be independent, don't rely on others. Now I might stray a little bit too much on the independent side, but um, she did teach me a lot about, you know, just making sure that I was able to, you know, have that sense of ownership, be able to uh, fend for myself and care for myself. So I, I love that. And so your story resonated with me. I love that so much. You know, it's, it's interesting how impactful mothers have on their daughters, especially mothers that are striving and some with some struggle, right? It really mm -hmm. has, it's had a huge impact on my sense of self and my career. I mean, I just don't know if I would be where I am today were it not for the the, the struggles and trauma that my own mother went through, right? Yeah, and, absolutely. you know, the, 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 the baseline of, of, um, of her, of me watching her, you know, go through life as a young girl, um, with people questioning, you know, her because she was not married, right? It's just really yeah. incredible how it's informed my success um, to ensure that my three sons, which I have, I have three sons, which they can see a mom like me. Um, but I also want to understand. So, okay, so you, so you, you didn't see like manufacturing or or in entrepreneurship. I, I really didn't either. Right. No, I didn't see really. any of that. Yeah, okay. No. So what kind of experience did you have when you were in school then? I mean, were you sort of, you know, going along 
the path of expectations or what was happening in elementary school through high school to college for you? So for me, my dream um, as a child, I really wanted to be a veterinarian. Oh my goodness. I really loved caring for animals and I thought that would be awesome. Um, I got into college with that in mind and I realized um, I don't like the side of blood, <laughs> which makes it really hard. So I switched to botany because I loved sciences. So my major in college was actually um, around study of plants and botany. And I love the way the plant system operated. Um, I loved also how um, plants also um, were kind of, there was an ecosystem with like pest, um, pest management and, um, you know, funguses and, you know, all sorts of different things like that. So soil science, I learned about that. I learned about weed science. It was just very interesting to me. I didn't really know where I was going to take it at that point because um, I just, I had switched from, I wanted to stay in the sciences. Um, so, yeah, after I graduated, I really didn't know what to do with it. And I ended up in corporate world. Um, oh my it's gosh. A, a personal passion of mine that we'll kind of, we could get into, but um, I really didn't um, know what I was going to do with it. And again, after I got out, my mom was a bookkeeper. And so I started off just kind of an accounting type of stuff, just because that's what I fell, up, fell back on and ended up in, um, in software that supported supply chain business um, processes instead. This is really interesting. So your mom was a bookkeeper. Was she an independent bookkeeper or does she bookkeep for someone else? Yeah, she, she bookkeep for other people. So property management and a modeling agency. Wow. So she kind of was an entrepreneur. Yeah. I mean, she did it. She worked in other, in, you know, she liked to, I think her, her favorite one was at the modeling agency because she got to kind of do what she wanted, but she got to work with these really cool people and, and you know, see some really neat things, go to fashion shows. So um, I think that was most exciting for her. You know, I love that. Um, I had an interview last, uh, a couple years ago with an author. Um, he won a Pulitzer Prize, I think in 2016, 2017. And it was fascinating talking to him because he said that he wouldn't, he didn't believe really that he would have, he had the success he had, or he was having, or he would be having forever were it not for seeing his parents work, you know, as entrepreneurs. And I find it interesting that when I first asked you about manufacturing or entrepreneurship, you said you didn't see that, but I'm hearing you talk about your mom having an independent life of being able yeah. to manage her own finances while she's managing other people's finances and also learn interesting things along the way. I mean, she was in, oh, yeah. involved in some ways in the fashion industry, right? Which um, yeah. is actually a really huge deal when it comes to, you know, supply chain and, and you know, barcodes and things like that. I just, I just love that how, you know, when we think about when we think about our, our, our visions of entrepreneurship, it's, it's not necessarily the narrative that we think it is. And we kind of sometimes take it for granted what we're looking at. You know what I mean? I also Very love true. that you're a woman in STEM. I mean, you were a woman in STEM, yeah. right? I mean, you were a sci you were in sciences and you somehow um, migrated to corporate, which I find fascinating. Um, I'm working for, you know, I work in the uh, STEM fields with several clients and I always love hearing the journey stories of people that, started off in STEM and ended up having extraordinarily successful careers that are not necessarily connected to STEM. How did you, how did you get there? I mean, how did you get from, you know, being in, in natural sciences, right. To, yeah, I mean, it's still kind of technology based in some ways, it but is, how did you make that technology. leap? Yeah. Was, I mean, it was really hard because at the time um, there weren't, weren't a lot of jobs. Um, Cause when I took the classes, it, I was following really my passion um, and I didn't really think about career. Um, I did mm. think of going on to grad school and maybe teaching. Um, I really loved studying. I loved science. I loved figuring things out. Wow, um, I love it. But, you know, life took me in a different different way. And so um, I, I had to go back to the basics. I mean, I ended up going back um, and taking basic, com you know, computer skills, Word, Excel, that because I just I didn't have that. Um, and, and you I weren't intimidated off, by that. Uh, no intimidation. You weren't a little bit, but okay. um, I figured I had to do it because that was where, you know, I felt it was just a necess uh, necessary skill to have. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And then I, I fell into a, uh, it was a temporary job. Um, while I was taking some courses, I thought I was going to take some business courses. So I enrolled in a graduate program, um, did accounting for soft, uh, did accounting for real estate, very similar to my mom. 
And I realized I hated the numbers. I hated, I thought it was boring. Um, I realized I liked talking to people and I liked problem solving. And I felt like the numbers was just like, it wasn't that interesting. So I then um, moved into a software company that was um, accounting based, but it was for um, building and lumber supplies. And so that's where I started learning about supply chain because I started to learn how uh, you tracked products um, using our software. But, you know, it was an accounting, but also like a purchase order invoice type of. And so I started to understand supply chain. And then I moved into um, a software company that really tracks. And this is um, going back to some fashion, too. It was kind of fun uh, uh, in mostly in the apparel space, tracking um, those transactions through the supply chain, so invoice, purchase orders, ship notices, but also the, the UPC barcodes in a system. So um, that's where I started, and that was about 20 years ago. And um, I really enjoyed it. I loved working with um, companies like Nordstrom and Macy's and Levi and all that. So it was really fun. So, um, you know, had an interesting career um, and a lot of great opportunities. I did project management. I did product management. Um, you know, I've been to a lot of customer sites and seen a lot of great things. I've seen a lot of distribution centers in, in the works. I've seen, you know, I've had some great opportunities in my career. I love that. You know, I just feel like you have a scientific brain. Um, you have a curious brain and you are able to sort of look at systems right from where they start to how they end. And that's exactly what a supply chain is in a lot of ways to yeah. me. You know, yeah. it's like a full like ecosystem of things happening. Um, I do think, um, you know, I've just found that women that were in sciences that transition to corporate careers, they, they have um, a different type of success. Um, I think then, um, and because I also think it's because you've been involved, like you just mentioned in so many other things, you just have a curious mind. And I yeah. really wish there were ways that we can cultivate that in more women, right? Cause we need more women in STEM. I mean, there's just a huge gap in, in women like you. Um, yeah. and it's not the lack of curiosity. I'm not sure what it is. I think I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of studies that are out there about why women are not in STEM, but do you have any insights about that? I mean, how can we get more women to do what you've done, which is, potentially go into a, 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 a life sciences or natural sciences field and then, and then, and then move into a corporate space like what you've done? Yeah, I don't know. But I mean, I think also it's just a modeling. Um, you know, I have two mm. young daughters. Well, okay. not young, they're now teenagers. And I'm finding now that since they're teenagers, I don't have to spend as much time caring for them. So I actually have enrolled in some other classes now, um, not related to my corporate world. So kind of going back to my plant roots, I'm, I'm taking some classes on learning, you know, herbal um, plant medicine. Oh, I, I love I think that's that. Fascinating. Um, yeah. So that's kind of my new passion on the side. Um, but I think it's just, you know, leading by example. I'm trying to teach my girls that, you know, even though I do have a very busy job and I have a busy life, I'm still always learning. Um, and I love sciences. I try to, you know, always encourage them to be curious about the world. Um, you know, and I think, you know, I see that developing in them, um, especially just because my love for plants, um, it's just been part of who I am. And so they're, they're interested in learning about the earth and, and plants and how our, how to help change the world, you know, because of, you know, climate change and all that stuff. So they're, they're kind of curious on that. So I think just leading by example is one way. I like that. Um, the other, the other day, um, not the other day, the other last month, um, when I was at the Fast Company Innovation Festival, I was able to be in the room with Diane von Furstenberg. And she was always saying, always be a woman in charge, you know, be a woman in charge. That's her, that's her yeah. quip, you know? Yeah. Um, how do you feel about that? Um, being in an industry that to me from the outside seems very male dominated, right? Um, to me, um, would you agree with that? I mean, do you feel like there's, it's, it's a male dominated space and you're sort of um, in a leadership role where there's not very many women, but you're still finding opportunities to, you know, like you just said, lead by example, not only with your daughters, but with other women in the industry, if there are any. I would say um, in my previous role, at the previous company, I was the only woman um, in a lot of my meetings. So it was very okay. intimidating sometimes, but I always just, you know, I'm here because I know I'm smart and I'm capable. 
Um, I, I am very yes. fortunate to Can work. we say that again, please? Uh, I am very smart. I am and smart. Capable. Yes. And I am capable. That's like that's yeah. like what you hear on the I I am remarkable, uh I am remarkable yeah. um platform is I am smart and I am capable. Yeah. That's beautiful. Um, I am fortunate though that the company right now, GS1 US that I work for, um, it has a lot of women leaders in it. So um I think uh it doesn't feel male dominated, it feels pretty equal in the company okay. I'm in now. Matter of fact, I think there's probably more women in the leadership roles than men. So <laughs> um, I, I think it's exciting and it's great to see, um, you know, at least it feels like it's changing or I'm at least in a company that has a, a different culture. So I don't feel that much um, where it may in some other industries. So talk a little bit about your role at GS1. And and I do want to understand, too, um, my understanding of GS1 was actually the Uniform Code Council. Right. That's right. that's where that's where I came from. I mean, I even have like, I mean, I even have I don't know if it's I mean, I even have my old brochure, you know, which is like my my uh, uniform oh my code gosh. council brochure. Yeah. I know. Yeah, I have all my my papers and, wow. you know, I have my my welcome letter that says welcome, you know, to the membership of, you know, uniform code council. It's really exciting. I have my my folder from, you know, back in 1999, I think. Um, the company has completely changed from from back when when I became a member with my with my record label Stomping Ground. Um, I'm just really curious. Um, what are you What are you What do you What are you actually doing at GS1? And what exactly? How would you when you go on online and look up what is GS1? And there's a, if you ever I don't know if you've ever done this before or when the last time you've done it. But if you put GS1 in Google, um, you'll have the series of the top questions that are asked. And there's so many questions. Nobody understands what GS1 is. No one really gets it. No one said, do you need it? You know, do you have to have this? Like, so can you talk a little bit about GS1 and then also talk about your role there? Sure. So um, most people know GS1 um, as the organization, um, as the administrator of UPC barcodes or even EAN barcodes. So you mm -hmm. mentioned UCC or the Unified, Unified Code Council. That's when it started back in 1973. We're talking 50 years that we've been around. Um, and it was really the um, the first, that's when the UPC barcode was, was um, kind of created. And um, it was really to help grocery um, industry, the grocery industry with price lookup. That was the main use case back in 1973. I'm old enough to remember going to the grocery store and people like typing in the um, the yes. prices and if the the sticker wasn't price sticker wasn't on the food, you know, you know, Hank, look up uh, product look up in aisle three, you know, kind of thing. Because if the price wasn't on there, it stopped everything in the line and they had to go look up the price. So that is um, really where it came from. Um, and then the first barcode was actually scanned in 1974. Um, it was a pack of Wrigley's gum, as you mentioned, in a uh, Marsh's uh, grocery store in, in Ohio. Um, since then, the barcode has come a long way. Um, um, so the UCC, or the UC, as you mentioned, the Uni Unified Code Council, really focused on the U.S. market, and that was UPC barcode. Um, and then the EAN, the uh, European Article Number Association, was created in Europe subsequently several years later, and the, bar the EAN barcode was um, kind of born there. So a 12 digit, 13 digit. But these two organizations lived on for a while separately, but then eventually they merged because we realized this is a global uh, mm, solve for product identification. So we merged under the umbrella of GS1. So we are now um, a global entity. Um, and that's when the change happened. I think it was in 2000, I think is the, um, the timing of that. Um, and so the, um, you know, GS1 became this global organization. We've had um, member companies around the world helping support um, just product identification, but it became so much more. So over the years, we evolved in not just that, that barcode for price lookup, um, our standards evolved to help supply chain business processes. Um, so you could start to track your product from source this is where supply chain and as that product gets then transformed in the manufacturing process, you have all your raw materials, they get transformed into a finished good. And then you could start tracking that through the supply chain when it leaves the point of manufacturer while it's being shipped, maybe overseas, once it starts to pass hands and it goes through um, 
like customs, um, and then you get it into your distribution center, and then you you know send it off to your stores, and where is it on your store shelf? And then at time of purchase, so you could start to track that product all the way through the supply chain. And we have standards starts with that barcode, but then other standards help track and trace that through the supply chain. So help me understand how far back does it go? Because there's there's a company that um, I was looking at a couple years, actually several years ago, and they actually wanted to trace products back to literally the source, like from the beginning of the dirt. Are we yeah. talking like are is, does GS1 is GS1 involved in that type of sourcing where you can actually even inform companies on things like, you know, sustainability? Because I was when I was at uh, Fast Company Innovation Festival, specifically on the fashion side, you know, they were mm-hmm. talking a lot about sourcing. So how far yeah. back do you go? You could go all the way back to, so so this is the part about my role. Um, I sit in the innovation team um, and we're doing, we're doing a lot of work um, because of technology, um, changes in technology and the ability yep. to start to track all the way back to source. Um, we just did one where you could start to track leather um, back to the cow, like the when the calf is born. What? So you could say, okay, here's the cow. Wow. The, the, and then, you know, you I sign that an identifier and then you could track it, you know, when it was, you know, sent off to have the leather, like the raw leather, and then the leather be actually like tanned and treated and all this stuff. So um, it's amazing how our standards have evolved. Um, and you could start to use, um, you know, different types of serialization. You could learn, um, you know, batch lot, like things like that. So we're, our um, standards have been evolving to be able to start to track all the way back to that source. Like, the cow. You know, that's so wild to me. I mean, because when, when I... Listen, I mean, I just think about all I wanted to do when I launched my record label was to was to was to assume I was going to sell a million copies and for everyone to know it and for me to get all the money. Just say, like, I got my barcode. (laughs) I got my number. And, you know, every single sale tracks right back to my ownership of my own bank of, you know, Mm -hmm. codes that nobody else can have access to. And now it's it's a it's I don't think that was happening back then. Right. I mean, that. Mm -hmm. What you're yeah. describing now was not happening in 1999. It was a much simpler business, right? It was. And I think, too, just because of one regulation and also just uh, socially, people want to know where their products come from. And so to have that whole chain of custody is um, something that I think a lot of consumers are demanding. I think also even just regulatory, we see a lot of it in Europe. And so, you know, and we talk about that that linear barcode that that went scan it for point of sale and price lookup. Um, that little barcode doesn't hold all that information anymore. So we're also innovating at GS1, and you're going to start to hear and start to see um, on your own products that barcode is going to change to more of a QR code or a, a two dimensional barcode because those two di- two dimensional barcodes can hold a lot more information so that you as a consumer can scan it with your smartphone and say, oh, I know where it came from. And, oh, that's really know, fascinating. Yeah. So we're we're always innovating too, um, but we're also kind of almost forced to. Otherwise, you know, what else would be, um, you know, how else could this be, you know, get that transparency on the product? So we're looking yeah. at like, what what does the consumer need? What does regula- regulation require? Um, and it's also just fun to be innovative. So. Right. I mean, do, you know, you're talking about people taking their phones out and scanning a QR code. Um, I, I mean, how is the, what is the difference between the barcode and the QR code? I mean, those are two visually different things for me. They are. So that what we're used to seeing, you know, at point of sale that goes scan and goes beep, yeah. that's, you know, one dimensional, it's a linear. It can only hold so much information. Um, and it's really it's going to be outdated and you're going to, you do see on some products already um, where that, that two dimensional barcode is there. And that two dimensional barcode just has the power to hold a lot more information, but also um, it could be as if you scan it in your, on your phone, just with your camera, it could lead you, mean you the to QR one place. Code. You mean the, the QR, QR code, code yes. the QR code. Yeah. If you scan it on your phone, um, just from your plain camera, but you could also scan it maybe from an app, like inside an app. Mm-hmm. And that might take you to a different location. It might take you to some coupons. If it's food, it might take you to some recipes, you know, electronics. It might take you to warranty information, things like that. So there's endless amount of possibility with 
with the two-dimensional barcode, that QR code, um, that we just haven't really understood the unlock of, of how much potential. Um, but we know that that's, you know, where products are going. And, you know, so we're we're working on, it's called Sunrise 2027, just to make sure all of the, um, the retailers can scan those barcodes um, at point of sale um, to be able to start to switch. So you still have the price lookup, but then you can have additional um, benefits too, consumer engagement, that sort of thing. So you need new technology, but you're also going to have to have client education around this, right? Yes. Because oh, yeah, people, the, the barcode is an invisible process for many customers. I mean, they're just, you know, they go somewhere, they buy something, they're not even really thinking about that process at all. There's nothing to do. You literally no. take your thing and you check out and you walk out the store. But now you're talking about a process that requires someone to think or encouraging someone to think, right? So that's that's a whole nother, like, you know... I mean, I don't know if that's your job. <laughs> like, well, that's our job. You know, it's okay. supposed to not not change it at the at point of sale checkout. So if we, you do self-checkout, you're still, oh, it's just a different type of barcode. It still goes beep. We could still do our product. But then, you know, you know, scan me for, you know, nutritional information. Scan me for traceability information. So there is that point of education for sure. Um, you'll start to see, I mean, some companies are starting to transition and they might have two barcodes on their products. And then some I've seen that are like all in now, like if you look at um, Puma, they they're like all in like this is the way to go. So they've put um, the 2D barcodes on their products. Uh, Pepsi is also moving that way, too. So um, it's just you'll start to see that shift in your products over the next several years. I'm really I'm really excited about that. Um I am curious, though, because a lot of the people that I engage with and I, that I write for and write about are small business owners. Mm -hmm. I really want to understand how does this apply to small business owners? I mean, I understand from my perspective what it means to me because I have an ownership mindset. Right. And one of the things that I'm always working on is how do I help other people have an ownership mindset? I was at an event a couple days ago and um, the whole event was focused on unpacking narratives that sort of trap you in a space that doesn't help you move forward, make money, transform your life, things like that. Um, I've never, I've never really had that challenge. I've always been like you, very curious. I want to know things. I want to know process. Mm -hmm. So how does this apply to a small business owner, right? Because Puma is, Puma and Pepsi, I mean, these are huge right. companies. What, right. what is, how do you tell a small business owner to get involved so that you actually can own the products that you make fully from the beginning to the end, right? I don't know if people know that they can do that. No, and and you bring up a good point because a lot of small businesses don't think about this stuff. You know, they they just want to get their product out in the market, um, but don't really think about some of the like we're so used to seeing barcodes on our products, but they don't really think about that piece. Um, so encoded in that barcode is a, a unique identifier. So there's a number associated. So it's kind of like uh, the product's social security number or license plate number. So that number, we call it a global trade item number or a GTIN, um, which is also can be sometimes referred to as a UPC, but it, the UPC is actually the barcode, um, but we use them interchangeably. So um, a lot, but that number, that unique number helps identify the product uniquely. It's great because then when you go to sell it out there in the market, especially on some of these major platforms or even in some of the major retail stores, those retailers then know how to uniquely identify it within their systems. Because if they were given all the products that have one, two, three, four, you know, if a consumer goes to sell it, they might get a, you know, a glass, a water bottle or, you know, a, a charger cord or, you know, so you need to have each one uniquely identified so they know exactly which product you're going to get. So we tell small businesses when you start to, especially if you're selling, want to sell goods like um, actual products to really think about where you want to sell your products. Um, and if you really envision, um, like if you have a growth mindset and say, yes, I want to be on the, st on the shelf at a Walmart or a Macy's or, a, you know, Safeway or Albertsons, you know, I really want to do that. You know, set yourself up for like, what are all the other products out there? What do they have that's that's common? You know, you need that that barcode for price lookup. Um, Amazon, same thing. Um, they have that requirement, even though it's not really passing a, a point of sale. They do need that number, that unique number to identify the products to keep it unique in their catalog. 
So again, thinking about if you have the same number assigned to multiple products, you know, you could order, you think you're ordering a water bottle and you'll end up getting a can of coffee, you know? So that unique identifier really helps to make your product stand out. So again, thinking when you're a small business owner, if you are selling goods that want to be sold in traditional, um, you know, retail outlets, um, that is the first thing to think about. Not a lot of people think about that. And they yeah. also then start to create their packaging without that barcode on it. Yes. And it mm-hmm. then, then they have to go back and then and redo it. They got to redo and it. It costs a lot of money. A lot of so, money. Yeah, I talk, I've talked about that a lot because in the old days, you know, <laughs> if you made a mistake on a packaging or a label, you have to redo the whole thing all over again. Because in my older, earlier life, when I did an internship, I worked at a packaging company. And, um, you know, there was just so much, so much detail into the packages. And, you know, God help you if there's a speck on the barcode somewhere that would make it not scan, you know, on yep. the artwork, it was just insane. But I, I want to understand. Um, so I'm a candle maker. Um, and I have 20 different candles that I like, and I'm going to sell all these 20 different candles. And I have you know, a hundred of each of 20. Um, can I go to GS1 and get, can I become a member and get, and get my pack of numbers? Like what, how, what is that process like? Cause I know what I yeah. did in 1999. Um, yeah. and I know it's still possible and it was expensive back then. It was like, it was almost $600 for me to get yeah. to become a member back then. Right. Um, so, right. you know, I want to know about that. Like I want, I, I want to do this myself. And I have a lot of small business owners that I work with that have no idea that they could own their own tracking system like this. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So um, the thing is, um, again, I understand where you came from because I worked with, um, at the time, UCC years ago in my other role. Oh, Um, you did? It was kind of hard to get numbers. I will agree. But I think GS1 US in particular has done a great job at at listening to small businesses and offering um, different types of um, packaging and bundling of um, the, the G10s. Um, to help meet their business needs. So um, if you, so we have a couple of tools. So you, and and you go to the gs1us.org website. So it's pretty straightforward right there. Um, And everything's now, because we're all living in an e-commerce world, everything's kind of online. Whereas I think probably before you had to like put it in order and wait several days for you to get your email back. Oh yeah. You didn't see all the paper. You didn't see my old fashioned papers in here. Yeah. You get a package <laughs> my, and it was I like, had a fax. I had to fax yeah, something. And it had to wait several days. Now everything's done <laughs> online and it's done instantaneously. So we, we've definitely um, evolved with the times too. Um, but when you go on the site, we have a couple of things, especially like if you think about your 20 candles, you, you know, some people might think, oh, I, I'm selling a candle, but then we say, okay, what kind of variations do you have? Are you selling at different sizes? Are you selling at different colors? Because each different variation, that size color variation, um, does need a unique number because, you know, as a consumer, if you want that, you know, medium sized red candle or rose scent candle versus the vanilla, like you want to make sure you have the right one. So you, each one and each variation needs to be uniquely identified. Um, So we have a tool that helps you determine like how many you need if you have variations. And then from there, we have different packages of um, or bundles of G10. So um, we have we call them the prefix, which actually gives you like a bundle number. So Mm -hmm. and I think probably when you came, our limit was at like 100,000 or 10,000. I mean, but we've now 100,000, 10,000 what? Of G10 that you could assign to your product. Like there was a bundle. No, I think mine is. Yeah, I mean getting into the weeds, I think it's more than that. It was, it was, yeah. it was a number that I would never reach. I mean, honestly, exactly. as, as, an we as an independent business owner. Out, we were automatically giving out just 100,000 capacity. Um, yeah. And for somebody, a small business, you, you don't need that, right? No. Um, so we actually, again, um, listening to our member base, realized we needed to have offerings all, you know, that meet every single size of company. So, um, in late 1999 or 2019, excuse me, we launched um, single G10. So you could come to us and get one or two or three if you had just like for that very small business or wow. that, business that just has like one or two items. You might sell a lot of them, but you're selling just one type. Um, and then we also have bundles that starting at 10 capacity. So you could get 10 or 100 or 1,000 or 10,000. So you know what? Really let me, try let me. To- offer that. Let me, let me ask you something. I want to, I want to, and I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I really just need to get to sort of 
the meat of this. I, if I'm listening to this conversation and I'm a small business owner, my question is, you know, why do I need this? Why should I have this? And this is, this again, to me is an ownership mindset, right? What is your, what is your answer to a small business owner to tell them this is better than you going to a third party reseller and having them capture the date, like capture the data or whatever they're capturing. Like, what is the, what is the sauce to say, this is why you should do this? Um, that you bring up a good point. So, you know, GS1 as a, a federated organization, so all, all the other MO, uh, member organizations too, we are really the only um, authorized um, provider of these uh, G10s. Um, there are companies out there that they claim that they could sell you, you know, barcodes quicker, cheaper, that sort of thing. However, if it's not coming from a GS1 uh, member organization, um, they are probably not truly, um, they're not probably truly sourced. Coming to GS1, um, we record the uh, that membership in a database and we call it Gapir. We are actually moving away from that because we're actually like building that foundation to a better, um, it's called uh, Verified by GS1 now, where you could actually oh. as a company or as a retailer, look up your barcode and say, okay, yes, this barcode really does belong to Jinja and it is associated to a candle. So it then can say, yes, this is, you know, an authorized that you are actually associated to that product. Your brand name is associated to that product too. And then it helps produce, like kind of cover your, your bases that yes, you did get something from GS1, but also helps support any kind of um, claims that may be like somebody else tried to use your number and, and, you know, it's not a product associated to you. So it helps reduce counterfeit. It helps just, it's just really more of that layer of verification that mm -hmm. it is um, a truly sort GS1 sourced barcode. And, you know, it is associated to your company. So once I have my barcode associated with my company and I have all my different numbers that, you know, are generated from my original digits to sell all the variations of the things that I'm making, um, and I have a company associated with this, right? Burke Design is my company associated with my with my products. Um, how does that align with the ownership of the company and the products? For example, if you decide you want to sell the company to another buyer, right? So I have my 20 candles, mm -hmm. right? And somebody says, I want to buy your company because you're doing so well, right? How does that work with, with the scenario? And alternatively, how about the concept of owning this, you know, this platform as part of your, 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 your products for your family in terms of generational wealth, for example, like how does this, cause to me, this all comes back again to me not assigning things to somebody else. And it really stays in my family and I can build a bigger business around that. And then also teach my own children how to have a growth mindset and an independent financial independent mindset, right? Yeah. So no, how, I mean, that's kind of a, that's kind yeah. of a, that's kind of a big question, but that's really why I want to talk to you because I think yeah. what I'm missing in the conversation that I have with a lot of small business owners is they're so busy in the business. They're not necessarily thinking about a long-term play around how mm -hmm. can this, how can this sustain you conceptually and financially forever? I mean, honestly, Michelle, we still get, money from mechanical royalties from albums that we manufactured in 1999, which we never would have today were it not for, you know, my barcodes. Right. It's that, it's really that crazy to me. Yeah. I think, um, so we have a process. If you um, sell your company, uh, it's just our mergers and acquisition process. So you just have to, uh, we have a form online, um, just contact us and say, you know, I sold my company and it's going to this company. And here's, we have a form and we ask for like a legal documentation that it did trade hands just so that that, that um, prefix or those identifiers go from company to company and we switch that company name. So um, we do have a process for that because we do want to make sure um, that those uh, those identifiers you know, they are assets really that go from they company are? to company. Can you talk uh, about well, that? I mean, well, I think, you know, they are assigned to the company. So I think it's, it's a, um, you know, part of your product identification portfolio. 
And so it is something that is, again, important. We put it recorded in our databases. The, the, it has uh, value. Different retailers or, um, you know, who knows what, you know, even a consumer can log into our database and say, okay, does this product belong to Jinjo's company? Um, so those are some of the things that um, I think are very valuable that um, Interesting. You know, doing yeah. that trade, that merger acquisition process will keep your identifiers with your company or with any company that, that, you know, may purchase your product going forward. So we always think not just your growth strategy, but if you are have an acquisition strategy, make sure that you do that too, because we find that people don't do that. And years later, when the new company wants to actually like list their product or, or a retailer then tries to verify their product and it's still associated with the old company, it's really hard to go back and get that, those hyster historical documents. So, um, we always think, you know, think about that if you have an acquisition strategy in mind too. Um, not, I love you again, for that. Not, a lot of people don't think about that. I, I love, I just love you for saying that acquisition strategy and succession strategy, right? Is it the yeah. same? Um, it could be. Yeah. Mm. But, but you always have to think, think growth. Um, I always think, you know, a lot of people also start with, you know, one or two barcodes, but then they don't think that, okay, maybe my product line will grow over time and I am going to need way more. And so maybe I should buy that bundle package instead because it, it will actually be, it seemed maybe costly at front, but it'll save me money in the long run. So again, we always, I always try to encourage people to think with a growth mindset like, and where your products are going to go. So, you know, some people think, well, if I'm selling it just on Amazon, I might be able to get an exemption and not list with that product. But then my product line got picked up by Walmart and now I need it. And so again, you have to go back and then yeah. package or so. It's a nice, it's just say, like, it's, it's crazy. Start off, yeah. Start off that you're going to succeed and set yes. yourself up correctly. Um, it will save you money in the long, run, long run and it'll save you um, a lot of headaches too. And I think, to me, it's it's more than money and headaches. It's it's again the the idea that you can start run your own business. <laughs> you know, this, you can have your own business from the very beginning, and as you said, believing from the very beginning that I'm going to be successful really does empower mm -hmm. you, especially if you are a woman owned business. I mean, it really makes a difference when you start understanding how much power you can have in ownership. It's got to start with Absolutely. your head though, right? It's got to start with your head yeah. first. And I think that's what you're talking about, um, which I really love about this. You know, you mentioned Amazon and I do want to understand a little mm -hmm. bit about Amazon. So I actually just became an affiliate marketer, which has nothing to do with, you know, barcodes, but still, um, right. you know, talking about other people's products. And that ecosystem is just so gigantic. If I am... If I am a person, a, a small business owner, and I have a product and I want to get it on Amazon, um, how does that work? How does that work? Because I feel like I also have a publishing company. I have a mm -hmm. publishing company. I also help people launch their own publishing companies, which requires them to have an ISBN. And I do the same. I have the same conversation. Like we're not going to use someone else's ISBN number. I'm going to actually set you up on Bocker.com, and you're mm -hmm. going to have your own bank of ISBN numbers. That way you can publish as many books as you want as long yeah. as you want forever. Um, so as far as Amazon and, you know, barcodes and GS1 is concerned, what is that relationship? And, and if someone is selling on Amazon, as you just mentioned, you know, having your own set of barcodes, you can sell anywhere, right? It, it's not just Amazon, like you can put your products right. in a, in a, you know, a, a grocery store, right? So can you talk yeah. a little bit about the Amazon piece? And um, that it's not just Amazon? I know they're yeah, the world's biggest retailer, right? <laughs> but still. Yeah, yeah, it isn't just Amazon. And like I said, you know, there are some product categories that have what they call G10 exemptions. It's usually like handmade products or collectibles, um, things like that. Very, there's not that many on Amazon. But, there's but not, why would but you, why would you do that though? You, it, they do, they provide that. But what we always say is, you know, if you're selling on Amazon, um, one of the first things it asks you is what's your product identifier? And that's where mm -hmm. you put in your G10. Um, you know, some companies try to, again, try to get around it. They'll apply for that exemption and they may get it. Sometimes they're denied. 
I think Amazon um, for a while was giving a lot of exem exemptions, but they are starting to really see the value in um, having that G10 associated to their product. So they're they're not doing as many G10 exemptions. As a matter of fact, um, I always check back on the list that they have out there. They're adding more and more product categories. So um, interesting, to, to I love it. G10 versus the ones that were kind of like you know you know optional. So. Um, Again, I think it really it's helps with inventory too because they have they manage a lot of their own inventory and it just helps keep that inventory um, really clear. Like this is this product and it belongs to this brand. Um, it just helps with that whole supply chain process as well. Um, and again, it helps with you with your growth if you put it on your product. Um, it, it really gives you that step in the you know foot in the door that you could like set set up on Walmart easily, on Target easily, or um, you know, any other major retailer, that, that's the first step that most of those other major retailers will request. Will request. So at least you're set I up. love it. I yeah. really love, I just, I'm so grateful to talk to you about all these things mm -hmm. because I am always struggling to help people understand how important it is to think like this, right? Especially yeah. when you're an independent business owner. Um, I also want to ask you a little bit about artificial intelligence, because one of the things that I learned um, when I saw your representation at Fast Company Innovation Festival was you were talking about generative AI QR codes and things like that. Um, I don't even know how to form the question because the space is moving so quickly that I'm not even understanding what in the world is GS1 doing with, you know, generative AI you know, QR codes, if anything, right? Like, yeah. what's what is happening in that innovation space since that's the area that you work in? Yeah, so we did just recently um, release a piece on generative AI. I think the big piece is, um, you know, there's a lot of data needed for gener generative AI. And having structured data also helps or having, you know, uh, standardized data, which again, that's where we um, really play a role, helps with creating you know the the framework on how you then can uh, structure that data and deliver it in a meaningful way so you know there's a lot around um, AI where it collects all this data and, and you have a ton of data but then what do you do with it so having standards involved in that helps allow you to be able to like put some structure to it so that you can run reports, you can do the analysis needed instead of just having just a big, huge data pool of, of information that you really don't know how to then get, get your insights from. So that's really the approach we take um, when we're looking at that. Again, we're still exploring um, you know, how standards can be a part of it. This is part of our innovation team. Um, we're always looking at new technologies, new ways of, of doing business, how we can help because you know our whole mission is really to help make business processes more efficient for businesses. And so again, how can standards help? How can we help businesses, you know, work through all this data, work through the technology changes, how you know, scanners and and um, analytics, all that stuff. That's where our innovation team really spends time focusing on like what's next and how could we help? And um, it's really exciting. We do a lot of things. We do a lot of things where we learn and we're like, mm -hmm maybe this isn't a good fit for us too. So that's the whole point about innovation. You know, you don't like to think about failure. Um, you know, you, people think failure is not a good thing, but we also try things and sometimes they just don't work out. Um, but, you know, that's how we learn and we're always uh, trying to innovate and see how we could help. Um, and again, it's really exciting to see, you know, how we could change businesses just from just a simple barcode into all these new areas that we can, we can really help businesses. Yeah, I mean, I, I like, again, when I was first, you know, launching my own business, I just, it just was incredible to me how much power I had because of this, because of my relationship with what was then the Uniform Code Council. I mean, it was just never in my wildest imaginations did I understand the ecosystem involved with that right? And now it's it's just gigantic. I don't even think GS1 has a competitor. I don't even, you stand alone. There's really, um, I mean, honestly, and, and it, it actually, you know, the last, the last technical question I have for you is, what are you doing? And maybe this is not your team, so you might not be able to answer this question, but 
what are you doing to reach more small business owners? And I say this because, you know, small business ownership drives the economy in the United States. I mean, independent yeah. people making things is what has made this country so shockingly amazing. And I think particularly for women, um, we've always been entrepreneurs. We've always been entrepreneurs. We've always made things. You know, we've always made do or made new. You know, yeah. we've always been creative strategists. We've always thought of ways to fix things because we're managing so much. And a lot of women I know, especially post pandemic, they're just like checked out and like, I'm doing my own thing. They're becoming coaches, they're writing books, they're launching products, you know, all these things. So, what is GS1 doing to reach this, 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 these people that have a growth mindset, but maybe don't have all the tools that we're talking about right now to really go to the next level? What are you doing about this? So that's a really good question. And um, I would say that we started seeing that small businesses were um, making up a big part of our membership um, for a while and then didn't really have a lot of tools for them because we were working with those big companies. Um, and so we spent some time focusing um, and building a team that focuses on small business outreach. Um, it is a large and daunting task, um, but we have, like I said, a dedicated team now um, where we didn't um, several years ago, that that's the main focus is how do we reach the small business community? What kind of resources do we have? Um, we've got a page that's focused on small businesses. We do a lot of small business highlights too. So we'll do little video clips to try to to highlight, you know, new um, innovative products, women-owned um, companies, um, small businesses, and we try to get ourselves out there. Um, we go to a lot of conferences that we wouldn't have traditionally gone to, but that focus on those small businesses. We work with a lot of small business, um, you know, business associations, things like that. Um, we're trying to get our name out there and our word out there, um, but it's a huge community. So um, it's very big. But yeah, it's been I mean, the focus of ours, and um, it's something I think we're really um, proud of that you know we get a chance to work with these small companies and, and highlight their story because there's some great success stories out there. And we just want to show you know people that you know you can start a small business and you don't have to have like a Pepsi type of uh, you know product line and, and growth strategy, but you could still start your own business, be successful, and be happy. I love it. I'm happy. I'm, I'm very happy. I mean, I'm extremely yeah. happy because I can come here and, and, and tell you that I got a check like first quarter last year for $535 because of some albums that we sold, yeah. you know, that track back to, to that are traceable and trackable. And mm -hmm. that's the only reason they sell because I have um, barcodes on all of my products. And I also have codes embedded in the music itself, you know, which I have yeah. to for radio airplay, but the actual sales of the products on Amazon and elsewhere and Apple yeah. or because, because of my <laughs> UCC code, you know, from, from back in the day. Um, listen, yeah. Michelle, this is a great conversation. I want to just fire off a couple of really quick questions for you to close this out. This has been an sure. incredible conversation. I encourage everyone. Um, can you tell us which, what's the best website for small businesses to go to on GS1? What's the best link? Can you share that? So we do have, um, it's just our, our main webpage, which is www.gs1us.org. Okay. Um, right there, um, you, if in the top nav too, but usually it's like, how, most people want to come to us to figure out like how to get those identifiers for their products. In the top nav too, we do have a small business resource section. Oh, okay. So we have that. Um, the other great tool we have is our YouTube channel. So there is a GS1 US YouTube channel. And because um, a lot of small businesses are usually, they don't think about this stuff because they're trying to run their business during the day um, and can't get on the phone with one of our member support um, people, or they're trying to do some research at night. And so we've created small, like getting started videos um, just that help you get in it. They're small, they're short. So you don't have to spend, you know, a two hour, you know, time, time block looking through videos and learning all this stuff. We try to make sure that they're kind of short and digestible so that you can learn, um, through videos. So we have that on our GS1 US, um, YouTube channel as well. All right. So we'll definitely include that in the show notes. And you also mentioned a new paper you've released on generative AI. Is that a public, publicly available paper? It is. We could provide that link too. Okay, great. Okay, fantastic. 
So um, a couple of last minute questions to ask you, which are off the beaten path. Um, do you have anything that you wish you could do over in your career? Um, no, because I think I've learned a lot, even if I've, you know, made mistakes from things, but I've loved all the companies I've worked with. I love the people I work with. So no, I've, I've enjoyed everything and I've learned something along the way the whole time. So I, I, I don't love have it. any regrets. Okay. Fantastic. What woman entrepreneur that's not a celebrity do you listen to? Um, I, well, I told you I'm taking classes to become um, an herbal plant medicine practitioner. So I listen to Rosemary Gladstar because she's just, first of all, amazing and super smart, but I love to hear her podcasts and just learn from her too. What's the name of her podcast? Um, just it's Rose. You can look up Rosemary Gladstar and she's got okay. um, a lot of different things on, on just herbalist, uh, being an herbalist and the different herbs and plants and stuff. So I love that you're heading into this new chapter, Michelle, where you're I really, I really do love that you're, you know, you're coming full circle around to a place of passion. Yeah. Um, and it makes sense to me. I love it. Um, yeah. what, um, let's see, um, what sort of average everyday working woman, um, have you seen on social media aside from the one you just mentioned, um, that you love reading their content. I mean, this person um, could even be someone in the corporate space. It could be a, a career corporate woman, you know, that you love watch reading on LinkedIn or whatever. It's, um, I have one, it's, it's at, she's actually a friend of mine, but I love to see, she owns her own PR company and she focuses on books and sometimes cookbooks. Her name's um, Andrea Burnett. And she, um, I just love what she does. I love her passion. Um, and even though I know her personally as a friend and we hang out personally, I love to see her stuff on LinkedIn because we don't really talk business, but I'd love to see what she's doing and, and who she's promoting and who she's working with. Um, cause she's, you know, she owns her own business and she's, uh, an entrepreneur and she is, uh, she's amazing. And I think it's inspiring to see what she does. I love it. Thank you for that. Okay. So a couple rapid fires, what is on your music playlist right now? Um, I am stuck in the eighties. I'm sorry. I have uh, my go-to <laughs> eighties playlist. Who are you listening playlist. to? What? I, I listen to my own eighties uh, playlist because I'm stuck in the eighties. My well, kids wait, laugh what? At but me. what of the? What are you listening to in the eighties though? Like what? Like you listen to rock, R and B? What's going um, on? Punk? You know, I have like The Cure, Depeche Mode. Okay. Um, yeah, that kind. Okay. No journey. No, no, not really journey. More of the <laughs> cure Depeche Mode type of. No Metallica. No, no, like the fir first wave type of things. I have New you know, Order. I'm serious, I listen to First Wave. So what about New I'm Order? I love New Order. See what I mean? Okay, all yeah. right. You're you're still down with me then. Okay. Yeah. Um. And are you lip gloss or are you lipstick? Uh, I am chapstick. I probably have. Really? And I am not kidding. I probably have about fifty <laughs> tubes of chapstick. I have them everywhere. <laughs> I, I did not realize how much chapstick I own. I opened my purse and like cleaned it out and I have five of them just run, and I have them in my car. I have three of them here on my desk. I have them in my bathroom. I have them in my kitchen. I have chapstick everywhere. So wait, um, when you say chapstick, do you mean the brand chapstick? Or are you talking about like Burt's Bees? Like, yeah. you know. Burt's Bees. Okay, yeah. Burt's Bees. Okay, Bees. I'm like that. I yeah, different ones for what, yeah. <laughs> you know, you're so funny. I wish I, I wish I, so let me show you what I've got. I have, um, I just found a new brand and I too have a zillion Burt's Bees and I also have the new Nivea. The Nivea has a really nice one, but I've also got like Nivea flavored ones, which oh. is like, I know. And they have a little Ooh. bit of color. They have a little bit of color. Um, okay. like some of them you're just like, I mean, you know, yeah, I love it. I know. Right. I love it. And I love this it. one's, this one's watermelon. And then I also tried this new one that I'm not a huge fan of. It's actually Lay Octane. Not a huge fan of this. Not really. Um, but anyway, I only bring it up because um, I am doing review. I'm going to be doing a review soon on lip balms. Oh. Yes. I just, I'm going to do some reviews because I have a zillion of them and my children are obsessed with them too, which is crazy to me. Um, last question. What book are you reading that's not a business book? I was ready for this one. I picked this up in the airport, um, The <gasps> Haunting in Venice Ooh. from Agatha Christie. Oh my it's goodness. It's a quick read. Oh, um, it's quick? Uh, 
it's a quick, well, I, I found it a quick read. I love mysteries. Mm -hmm. um, and it was something I bought in the airport because I was like, oh, I don't have a book with me. And I picked it up and I couldn't put it down. Actually, I just finished it. And um, my daughter's going to read it too because she wants to go see the movie together. But um, I loved it. So that was my new yeah. recent one. I love Agatha Christie anyway. I mean, yeah. totally. Like I used to read a lot of her when I was, when I was, well, I was younger in high school, a ton of Agatha Christie. Michelle, thank you for joining me on the Honest Feel Guy podcast. This is such a great conversation. And I want everyone, everyone to learn more about GS1 as an entrepreneur, as a manufacturer. You have products. Really, this entire conversation around ownership um, and what it means and how you can have tools to actually help you own a lot of the processes in your in your whole entire experience as you're developing your company. This is a real integral part of it. And I really meant it when I said, because of this platform, I still make money from 1999. And it would not happen were it not for this tech for this technology. It just wouldn't happen. I would have music out there. It would be, it would be selling and I wouldn't have any way to you know, benefit from it. And this money is going into my bank account and adding to my generational wealth goals for my family. So this is this is a really big deal. It sounds kind of technical, but I'm telling you, it's really meaningful for all of us that are entrepreneurs in the United States of America. So thank you again, Michelle, for joining my show. I'm Ginja. I'm Michelle. And we'll talk to you next time. The Honest Bill Guide is produced by the team at Burke Creative, where brand and multi-channel strategies are designed to help you get attention, grow, scale, and keep up with the pace of change. The music on the podcast is written and performed by Utah Carol. You can find their songs everywhere online to buy or stream. The opinions expressed on the Honest Field Guide are solely those of the host and guests.